Thank you, Pete. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, welcome on this lovely, beautiful spring evening. Isn't it just gorgeous? And I really appreciate you taking the time to come along uh, tonight. And hopefully we've, we've, yeah, we've refreshed the format. For, I've seen a lot of faces before and we hope that you enjoy this, but you can give us some feedback afterwards. So how it's going to work is obviously, you know, you know about the panel, we've got Simon, we've got Irving, we've got Jill, we've got Hamill and obviously myself. Um, so one by one, we're just going to give you an update on some things uh, that we think you might be interested in. We might answer a few questions that you already have uh, burning away uh, inside. And if we don't, as Pete said, you can answer those uh, or ask those for uh, the second part of the evening. Um, and in the break, as Pete says, um, your lovely tour guides are going to be taking you around the facilities and there's a little bit of a competition going on with the, uh, the, some of the team. I'll, I'll come on to that a little bit later. But all I can say is I didn't realise how competitive <coughs> the team were off the pitch as well as on it. So uh, yeah, it's really quite interesting when you set a challenge like this. But we'll come back to that and they're all smiling away at me now. So on the screens, hopefully you've got something on there at the moment that says welcome, fantastic forum. Has everyone got that? Yeah. Right, here's the first test for the team. Has everybody received a letter when they came through the office? So you should have an A. Give us a shout if you've got an A. Yeah. Fabulous. Have we got any Bs? Fantastic. We've got any Cs? Have we got a Ds? Have we got Es? No Fs? No, we didn't get to F, that's all right. So how it's going to work, and I'm, I'm getting there now because I tell you what, if you'd have been here this morning in this pre-planning uh, meeting, you'd have laughed your socks off. It was one of those that you go, this is like an episode of The Office, if anybody's old enough to remember that. Trying to explain to the team how this is going to work. Anyway, so how it is going to work, I couldn't think what could possibly go wrong with this. If you have an A, all the A's are going to go on the little stadium tour together with two of the team. If you have a B, all the B's will get together and go on a little tour in the opposite direction. So you're not all in the same place at the same time. Um, let's just see how it goes. You can give us a feedback later. Right, shall we crack on? Uh, some information from me then. Mine's more of a general uh, overview. Just thought I'd give you an idea of what the capacity is looking like on the screens there, you'll see. So you, you notice we've been a building site, well, pretty much for the in last couple of years. Um, but we finally got to our capacity requirement at the, on the 27th of November, to be precise. At about 4.30 we got signed off ready to play Wrexham on the 28th. <laughs> That's how close it was. That was the target. So we are now on paper, I hasten to add, our, is our capacity is 5,056. When you're an EFL club, you have to have 5,000, and you also have to have 2,000 seats, and we have 2,016, so we've just got in there uh, with a smidge. In fact, we're over. Isn't that brilliant? About <laughs> 16 whole seats. Um, I say operational capacity is slightly different. We work to around 4,000 at the moment. Um, we have to work with our safety advisory group and um, it's a stepping stone exercise just until we get used to being uh, a bigger club with bigger crowds and particularly with bigger away crowds because we're learning how to be a bigger club with bigger fans <laughs> and bigger fan bases. Um, and yeah, it's quite good. We've done all right so far, touch wood. Um, so we'll see how that grows. 
you'll you'll get to see these later but you'll see the tour if you, by the way the tour is optional if you don't like the look of your tour guides it's fine <laughs> you know just come and see me on saturday and i'll show you around um but we've added new food kiosks uh, for home and away so we've got dual purpose so we can make a dynamic assessment depending on how many away fans so like for Sutton on Saturday we only had 172 didn't need it for home um, uh, for away as well sorry but if we've got say a Bradford where we've got over a thousand we use it for home and away so it's it's got the uh, ability to do both more toilets and um, for the first time since well certainly since we've been a league club we've finally got a bar for our away supporters as well so that takes us up to the four bars and you'll get to see that one. You'll notice it's like a padded cell, padded room, with lots of nothing. It's just a room, but it's a very nice one. But you know, we, we go to town with the decor and all the other bits and that is nice, but it's functional and you'll see that for yourself. So I'm gonna go straight in with the finances. Um, I think it's been publicized recently, um, our, uh, you know, our financial situation was published in the Stray Ferret. That was um, after depreciation, so it's no comment was made by us because we didn't get asked, um, otherwise we would have quite gladly given a comment on that. Um, so just to, to give you an idea, um, I'm showing you here the blue, which is our year end up until June 2023, which has just been uh, published. The orange is what we're looking to forecast by this coming year, so we're nearly at the end of this coming year's uh, financial year, obviously. And then the grey, uh, tentatively, because these aren't finalised yet, but we're looking towards next year and trying to plan ahead. Um, as you can see, your turnover is going up, so year on year, we're really pleased, 21% year on year up on turnover. Um, and then we're forecasting again, this is very, very tentative, but another 5%, but I, I reckon it'll be more than that next year. Um, at the same time, the middle uh, three bars, you'll see the costs. So the costs have gone up 10%, not quite 21, um, but it's on obviously a much higher uh, amount of money. And then we are looking to reduce the costs next year by around 7% on this current year. So where does that leave us? So this is before depreciation. Um, not, I'm not saying these figures, by the way, with a smile on my face. No, no business wants to lose 2.3 million pounds. Um, we're forecasting to lose about 2.1 million in this current year, ending June. And then for next year, we're hoping to squeeze that down to 1.7. Uh, Irving is going to talk more about the fan-led review and how the football industry and you know the um, distribution of revenues works is looking uh, shortly. Um, but the things I did want to say on this slide because this is the question I get asked all the time and you know quite rightly as well because we have to become sustainable and what does the future look like? What the reassurance is? That type of thing. Um, I think. The one thing I would ask you to say is every single football club is struggling pretty much. Um, it's not a, a business that you can run um, on a shoestring. And that, that, you know, the, the graph speaks volumes. Um, you just can't run a competitive league football club without investing a lot of money. And that this, everybody thinks it's just about the players and what we're spending on the players and their wages, and it really isn't. It's everything else that goes with that. It's training grounds, it's medical costs, it's medical insurance, it's travel costs, it's operating staff. You know, everything goes up behind the scenes. And we run, um, I would say, quite efficiently. We're nowhere near the biggest in terms of staff. Uh, we're not the smallest either. I mean, we've been to clubs where people are literally doing 20 jobs each. Um, we believe in, you know, speculate to accumulate. And if we want to grow, we've got to have the best team. And that is on and off the pitch. And I'm delighted that most of the operational team are here and we have got the best team. So thank you to you guys because they're fantastic. Everybody works really, really hard. 
Um, so what my job is and my team job is, is we've got to get these costs under control. They are, you know, there's very much, um, very little you can do in terms of costs unless you're going to start really slipping and other clubs have done that. So our job really is to try and get the turnover up. So the one thing I'd just say is that we haven't had the facilities we've currently got. I'm going to show you attendances in a minute. Um, you'll see what the difference has made having those new facilities in a second in terms of attendances um, since November. But we, for a year and a half of these on this graph, we haven't had these facilities. We've missed half of this financial year um, as well as all of last year without having, not only have we not had the increased capacity, we've actually had to reduce the capacity while we've been a building site. Um, so obviously that has hindered our progress, um, but it's looking more positive, so we're really pleased about that. And as I say, Irving will jump onto the, uh, the distribution of revenue. So going on to attendances, um, you'll see last year's in blue, this year's in orange, and then on the right hand side um, there is a, a purple uh, bar which shows the last 12 games and I've put that on there because that's when we got the new stand. So um, combined we're up 17% year on year but really delighted to say 22% for home supporters and that is the bit that we're in control of and that's what we're aiming for, growth. Away 7% but that's because we didn't have the, the capacity until end of November. Um, the last 12 games though, if you average the uh, supporters out, you know, based on your average attendance for last year and this year for the last 12, we're up 31% and that's the difference at new stand and obviously the incremental revenue that comes from the back of that. So next year we're going to have a whole year uh, to play with and you can imagine what the difference is for a club of our size, it's absolutely uh, essential. Um, so we're delighted. And then the two on the end, I just thought I'd pop that on for fun because it wouldn't be a football conversation if Wrexham weren't mentioned. Because they always are. You know, you get Stockport going up as champions and Wrexham get all the, uh, the, the publicity this week. So, um, but I'll leave the last, um, the last nod to Bradford, shall we, in the green. So they were our uh, two record uh, tendencies so far, unless something happens on Saturday, which is looking really, really good for MK Dons for our last game of the season. So that Bradford game, we were just nudged, just shy of 4,000. Um, and I can't wait till we hear over the PA the announcement of four plus, and I, I'm sure we'll see that or hear it soon. Um, just a couple of other bits for you from me before I hand over to Irving. So we have uh, commercial partners, and I, I'm bringing this into the mix because I think from a turnover point of view, um, we have some of the sponsors in, in here tonight, and I have to just say a massive thank you because you're amazing, and we don't just have sponsors that give us money to put names on a board. That's not how we work. Um, got Joe here. Where's Joe? Our commercial director is somewhere hiding. I can't see. Oh, she is hiding. Um, yeah, we, we, we want commercial partners with integrity and the same values we've got. So we handpick. We don't just go after anybody. Um, we think that's really important that we're aligned with our commercial partners. We launched our very first business club in January. Uh, we had our, our own Simon and uh, Roger Black MBE as our first guest speakers and they were brilliant. It went down the storm. And the idea is we've teamed up with Your Harrogate, uh, Pete's team, haven't we? So it's the Your Harrogate Town Business Club and it works really well in collaboration. So it's um, all of your Harrogate's clients, all of ours, we get them together and they network and it's really good fun. Um, and for the next one in May, we've got Eddie the Eagle. So that should be fun. Um, so what's next? Nearly there from me. So yeah, we've got um, loads going on actually. The, the, there's not loads of detail on some of these, but just to, to let you know the sort of thinking that we're, 
where we're at as a club. The player development centres are absolutely buoyant. I mean, we're nearly doubled our number of uh, children that we're coaching every single week now with the addition of the Rosset uh, Centre last September. And it's allowed us to go slightly younger. So we've got the first time footballers now from the age of four, or the little ones, um, who are doing really well and enjoying it. Um, so we'd like to expand on that and, and look at uh, more of the player development centres as well. Um, we've also got uh, a huge um, sort of overview of our youth development scheme with our academy and also with our uh, women's teams as well who are doing really well of coming back this year um, but yeah we, we want to grow that women and girls football as you all know is on the up um, and we are really behind with that if I'm honest and we need to get ahead so that there's going to be a lot of focus on that for us for this year. But the main focus, I think, coming back to the uh, attendances, um, our ambition really for next year is we need to add around 500 home supporters for every game. That's what we'd really like to do, and that will get us really where we want to be. And just get to that place where we've got the 12th man, so to speak, at every single game, and just get that atmosphere uh, absolutely rocking. Um, so I think that's it from me. I'm going to, oh, before I uh, click on that, I'm going to hand you over to Irving. Thank you, and I'll uh, speak to you again very soon. Ladies and gentlemen, you to the next one again. And now keep the applause going, Mr. Chairman, Irving Weaver. Good evening, everybody. Are you, are you all settled in? Yes. Yeah, good. I'm, Actually, quite a, nice to stand up here on the mic because I've suffered all the home games where we've got this Simon Weaver comes up and does all the questions and answers and takes all the glory. <laughs> I might not get the glory. Right, I don't know, just hands up, um, has anybody got who, who's not heard of a fan led review? Everybody's. Right, but mostly everybody's somewhere there. Well, to be fair to, um, I give him great praise, is uh, Rick Parry, the chairman of the EFL. He set about looking at the anomaly of finances and sustainability for football, in particular English Football League, National League, and the differences of those that have and those that have not. And the Premier League has just out, out from every, everybody in the world with consequences down the pyramid. So no, we did set about a, a, a real task of challenging um, the upper echelons of football in this country. And that started in 2019. So he's been on our five year journey and he's nearly, nearly there at the end of it. And he's managed to get parliament representation. He, everything you could think of He's thinking, he thought of it, how to get on top of this anomaly. So I just, um, it's on the screen there, but I, I, I'll just read um, my notes that lead from that. And um, we've now got an independent regulator that's going to be appointed after it's gone through uh, Parliament, which is on, it's the bill is being passed through now, uh, the Football Governance Bill. And this sets out in an 162 page document um, the, the situation, how it all lies at the moment, and how uh, Rick Parry said, yeah, the pyramid, it's that unstable, it's like having it on its tip and it's going to fall over. And I thought he, he, he described that to, um, very, very simplistically. So the objective, um, we are talking about September 2024 for the passing of the bill. The government are already financing with taxpayers' money, which they'll claw back, um, to set up this, uh, the institution of, a, of an office. Um, they've got um, a regulator in mind already to join them in September. They're allocating £10 million a year to staff this, to put some real, um, real energy behind the drive of, of, of pushing it through um, and what they want to achieve. So by September, um, they'll be fully, fully flowing through with the uh, objective. 
and that is to deliver financial sustainability to clubs at all levels of a thriving and competitive football pyramid. This should eliminate or significantly reduce the necessity and three cheers for this for owner funding. <laughs> I'm glad you think it's funny. Um, in 1993, the turnover of the FA Premier League Limited in its first year was £45 million. Pounds. And the EFL, so that was for 20 clubs, and the EFLs was £34 million. In 30 years since, the Premier League's turnover has grown 70 times to three billion a year. If you compare that to the EFL with, a with 72 teams, the income for the EFL has grown 5.5 times, just 6% of that achieved annually by the Premier League. And this is a pyramid, supposedly achievable as a rise and fall of the, 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 uh, of the, of the results of endeavors of 92 clubs. The fan-led review will result in a redistribution of media revenues received by the Premier League. The regulator has total independence to analyse, justify and direct and ensure. Gone are the days of waiting for votes to be fair. The pyramid of 116 clubs is involved because there's the Premier League, the EFL, three leagues, and in fact the National League now as a full-time league. It may well be that the redistribution is agreed between the leagues, uh, and the regulator will be a backstop if it fails at the final hurdle. There's been five offers, not offers, proposals from the Premier League since September last year where the EFL voted for the funds of £880 million pounds allocated over five years to sort the problem out. It went back with a full vote by the EFL, all in a, we were all at Derby County, and it went back for the Wednesday meeting following to the PL, and it got voted down. Funnily enough, uh, it got voted down by the top clubs. So there's a, a real problem of getting the, the franchise to, to progress. We haven't got any reporters in here, have we? <laughs> From a football fan's perspective, there will be protection of the heritage of football clubs. New tests for prospective owners and directors of football clubs. Implementation of a minimum standard of fan engagement. Reinforce existing protection around club heritage. Fans will have a veto over changes to the club badge, the home shirts. That'll be a tricky one when you all decide which shirt you want. <laughs> Clubs will only be able to compete in competitions that are approved by the regulator. This means this will prevent clubs from joining a breakaway competition that does not meet predetermined criteria such as a Super League style breakaway league. And the regulator will operate a license system where clubs will need a license to operate as a professional football club. So we might be at the end of the game now. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Tom. So, so, very and remember, if you've got any questions to add to what Irving has just said, then scribble them down on the pad and we'll get to those in the second half. Uh, now, once again, put your hands together as we welcome Hamill Fan Engagement Manager. Right, so, can you hear me? No, no. Can you hear me now? Um, I'm just going to talk about the um, Family Excellency um, Award, which is awarded by the EFL. Um, basically, it's a mystery shopper, um, it's a company that um, works with EFL, so it's all independent. But when we looked at this, um, we felt it was really important for us um, to really go at this, um, for us to develop um, the fan base. Um, we targeted um, families 
So what it did was it um, showed the whole um, process of, of um, um, looking into how you purchase a ticket all the way, basically the, the, the journey throughout um, purchasing a ticket um, entering the ground. So I'll just quickly go through the, um, the points of uh, the scoring system. Um, the website's uh, first impression, so when people are purchasing the tickets, uh, what information is on the website, uh, is it easily accessible, can you find things there easy, um, you don't have to go searching for things. Um, this season we've uh, improved the website, we've got a new website uh, which I believe is a lot easier um, to, to find things, it's set out a lot better and it's more um, football oriented for the fans. Uh, a ticket purchase, so if the fan is looking uh, at the family stand, is that easy, identifiable, uh, it could easily um, find it on the map, if people have got special requirements, uh, wheelchair access accessibilities uh, and things like that. So all the information um, that you'd expect, uh, is that um, a clean message? Is this a stand where you want your child to be in? Um, is it clear where is it, if it's a family stand? Uh, is it behind a goal? Um, you know, obviously it's going to be more um, loud and boisterous. Uh, social media, which is a massive um, influence. Um, is social media up to date? Uh, is uh, given the right information on match day? Um, there's been a lot of work done by the media team uh, in terms of um, video, um, um, video rather than people looking at massive amounts of information. Uh, there was like videos out there, how the, and the, and the media team was done. It just makes it easier for people to look, so what to expect, so when they're coming to the ground, um, they can visualise it. And this helps with especially uh, disabled fans as well. Um, outside, outside the stadium, this is a bit difficult for us because obviously we are landlocked. Uh, but we, I think a couple of months ago we sat down uh, at a meeting and we realised that um, if you were coming in from a motorway or you're coming in from town, um, there's no sign that says, you know, um, whether in a football ground. Uh, if you go to Leeds United or anywhere, um, even in York, you'll see a signpost that says stadium this way, you know, how you tell. Uh, and, and that's something that we've, um, we're on with and we're looking at. Um, obviously, we haven't got the space um, to do a lot of things. Uh, but we have looked at, um, especially next year, we're looking at the fan zone. Uh, we launched it a couple of weeks ago, um, um, and it, it's work. It's work in progress. Uh, we've got the uh, ability now to use the Heverdean car park, uh, so there's an area there uh, which we can use for an extra touch point. So when people come uh, and visit us, there'll be activities there for us to do. Uh, and next season, I believe, um, I believe that's a game changer for us because it's going to help um, increase family attendances. Uh, we can. Um, advertise things on there, if you're doing a special um, uh, a game related to the FL, kick race system out or anything like that, uh, we can you know, educate people and uh, along working with the uh, Community Foundation, um, advertising of the good work that they do as well. Um, retail and merchandise, um, again it's looking at what kind of stock we have, um, there's a big emphasis on um, tools and stuff, so it'd be like pocket money, so if a child comes with a family, uh, and a child's got some pocket money, what can they get for, you know, five or six pounds or so? Um, I know um, Claire did some work on that, so able to get us, like, I think there's pencil cases and little bits of that, badges and things like that. So that the children can uh, purchase things uh, inside the ground and outside the ground as well. Um, inside, um, refreshments, so what we're looking at is, um, do we offer, um, soft drinks, what, what kind of soft drinks are for children, um, would it be food, um, so we've got healthy options for food, we've got um, Harry Gator meal, uh, which has got food and things in it, so it's not such as uh, a burger and things, no chips or anything like that, um, it's more healthy option for the kids. Um, and then we move on to inside the stadium, um, it's a clear signage, uh, are the people there, stewards in the right place, if people got a, a question to, um, that they need to answer, where's the toilet, could be anything like that, so um, again it's the attitude of people in the stadium, whether you're talking to um, a member of staff or a steward or anyone like that. Um, post game, uh, again, um, anyone that comes to the first time visitor, um, we ask a questionnaire uh, back to them, so 
we we then set, asked them to ask us how we did, and is there anything we could improve on? And again, if you purchase a ticket, um, the media team will send an email out um, giving you the information on the uh, reports and, and, and the next game that's coming up. And then the most important thing at the end there is do the fans feel valued um, when they you know when they've finished to come out and had the, the had the entertainment of football, uh, we've had a good day, uh, win, lose or draw, and did they go out feeling that? Tell you what, that was value for money. I really enjoyed that. Um, obviously, you, <laughs> Sam would love to win every game, but obviously you can't. But it's not just about that, it's the experience within the stadium, and it, it's how the people and the fans feel um, afterwards. So we still get in contact with them afterwards um, and things like that. So um, the first year, um, these are the results basically, um, next slide here, if you look at it. So the EFL family scheme, um, Halgate Town achieved silver status in 2024. Uh, we ranked 34th out of 72 clubs um, compared to where we were um, the previous year, which, which we were at 61, which we were at the bonds level. Um, you can so basically what you're seeing is the whole hard work that everyone's put in, uh, and it's not just it's not just relies on, on the fan engagement department, it's my role uh, literally touches every every department, um, right the way through to Rachel in, uh, in the um, um, the coaching team, the medical team, whether it be Mary, uh, secretary, whether it be uh, Sarah, Joe, uh, and obviously Hal, uh, and obviously tickets as well. So everybody put that input in and we made all the changes um, and we've, uh, I think we've done fantastic and I believe you know, next year we could do even better. So we, we ranked six in the league out of 24, uh, and most of those points that we saw in the previous slide were rated out of um, uh, 10. Uh, we scored an average of eight, um, which is pretty good. So we're not far off the um, gold status. Um, first time fans, um, this was something that um, you look at that screen there and you think, well, that's pretty basic stuff. Um, but you'd be surprised how many clubs don't even do this um, and I, I call these like little one percenters which makes a difference so what we're doing is we, we don't capture everybody's first time visit because uh, sometimes people don't you know um, see that a lot or someone else buys, it, buys them a ticket so we do as much as we can uh, but what this does is the whole idea of it is to make those people that come that for, for the first time special so the, it's you know it's going to be a child where we do something that it's gonna, they're going to remember for the rest of our lives. And in doing so, um, they become um, a fan. Um, they then come to the next game, hopefully come to more games, uh, buy merchandise, and, you know, and, and hopefully end up buying a, a season ticket. So what we do is um, we fill in the form from the website, um, and then we get all the information. Uh, we give them like, videos and things like that, fun to, uh, to have a look at. Um, so the option is a photo on the LED screen. Um, so they send a, a picture in and we can put it on the, uh, the big screen. Uh, but last year um, we got a merit for that from the EFL um, when we went to the awards. Uh, that was just, again, you think, well that's something really simple, but the process that they found out um, was it was an easy process. So you go into one person rather than getting bounced back to three or four different departments. Uh, and it was a straightforward and um, easy process. Uh, and again, obviously featuring the program as well. Yeah, shout out on PA. These are just really simple things, but they really make a difference. Uh, meet and greet with team. Um, sometimes um, we'll have a, uh, if it's a special occasion, we'll get grab a, a few players before the game. Um, this really makes a difference. Uh, even if it's a two-way conversation, or at the end of the game, we'll have a quick photograph with the uh, with the players. It just means so so much to that individual. Um, I told the same. Can you like to go? Sorry, no. Yeah. Um, I told the stadium, uh, which is obviously if they come early enough, um, um, we can get to do that. Uh, the really good thing is the photo in the dugout. Um, again, it's, it's really good because what it does is that Matt, the photographer or of its body, will come and it's a professional photograph taken uh, and they get that copy to take with them and you know, they can get it printed. But it, it's, a, it's a memory, it's a memory that's gonna, you know, they can look back in years to come. Uh, and again, <coughs> the good thing about um, 
this club here is is, is the, the, the players, the accessibility to the players. Uh, I, I personally I think that the, the players realise um, how much it means. So, so when you this is part of um, the, the SLO's job when they go to you know take the player on the pitch or the different player after the end of the game, the the expression of, of the child is you know this is a professional footballer. Uh, it means so much to them. Um, and, and again, it's something that they, you know, they'll remember. But some, seeing some of the faces and, and the players, to be fair, we're really good with them, with, um, with fans in terms of, you know, photograph. You know, everybody uh, will come out and take a photograph or um, give her an autograph. This is the um, um, EDN9. So we created a, a bonds level. Um, there's a lot of hard work gone into this, uh, a lot of processes, a lot of procedures uh, have been put in place. Uh, I always remember last season, um, we played Rochdale on a Monday, uh, I opened up uh, my laptop and we got a, a, um, a complaint from one of the fans. And what it was, was uh, it was a table fan, a season ticket holder. Um, and uh, yes, it was raining, he knew it was going to be raining about his experience um, of that day uh, because of various things um, wasn't happy. So his wife um, emailed me to say, you know, he's, he's, we're probably not going to get a season ticket next year. Um, I looked at the, uh, the evidence that we had and I was thinking there's so much we could do here. Um, so myself, uh, uh, Sarah and Dave um, and a lot of other people have done some really hard work. Um, uh, went to, in that same week, went to an EFL conference. Uh, we met the people looking for what that could help us um, to get um, loads of ideas from. Um, I know these ideas um, that we've done, um, again, some of them that you probably even most clubs will, will do anyway. Um, but, you know, um, I was telling Sarah the other week that we're getting emails from EFL clubs, you know, um, Sheffield, um, Jeff Wednesday, um, Preston, uh, Hull City, just saying little things because we, we share information um, as clubs in, internally. So, uh, oh, I heard you done this, how have you done that, or, or where can we get these century packs from? So, we know that uh, there's more impacts that we're doing um, other clubs. Uh, um, and looking at us and, and to see how, how, how we've done those things. So what we decided to do was uh, more accessible seats. You can see on a, on a match day, uh, especially the Black Sheep stand now, uh, there's more accessible seats. Um, <coughs> sensory packs um, for, for children, so you can go online now um, and book your sensory pack. Um, they're really, again, really popular. Um, Hearing loops, which is a standard thing, but a lot of uh, football clubs work, work, have that at the uh, the ticket office or a, um, the bars or food outlets. Um, Stormer toilets, um, again, I think it affects uh, the, the quarter of a million people in the UK. Uh, these, these little things were uh, having the facilities like that. Um, people feel comfortable coming to the football games now because uh, in, in the past, um, going to uh, an arena, whether it be sporting or, or a concert, these people didn't feel comfortable doing it because uh, because of the situation. Uh, we've worked with Herdium 2, with um, and the ladies' toilet sanitary products, uh, again offering um, um, advice and uh, products as well. Uh, and then we have got our very own dedicated uh, disability liaison officer, Maggie, she's just around the corner there. Um, she does a fantastic job. So. Um, anybody with accessible uh, um, disability requirements um, we're able to cater for so we can get in contact with them before, uh, arrange uh, a meet and greet. Um, and you'll see uh, Maggie going up and down the, the stands um, vigorously on, on a match day. She probably does more steps than what I do. Um, uh, but it's really, what it does is really well because those people feel valued now. Um, You'll see, see them more than the games. Uh, there's a seats service as well. So at half time, um, obviously, if they wanted something to eat, um, they find it hard, especially in this ground, to go and queue. There's QR codes where you can pee all of the food, uh, and uh, a member of the team will bring it to them at half time. And um, recently, we've introduced the parking on the match days, so we've got spaces at um, Hemding Car Park, which is just um, behind the GH Brookstands. 
Uh, again, that's a game changer for us because um, you know the FL is always telling us that you need to have the spaces, and well, obviously we're restricted, but it does make a lot of difference. Um, um, so even if it's like I think it's 20 spaces, but um, it, half a dozen of them, it makes so much of a, of a difference. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, before I go, I'd just like to thank the SLOs. Uh, that be, Phil's not here today, can't make it, Fiona, uh, uh, but Richard's here. And they do a fantastic job on the match day to make it easy for, for me. Um, and these are the people that make the difference. Uh, we know it's working, it's proved um, with, the, with, the F, uh, um, with the EFL reports that we're getting and all the feedback we're getting, um, more and more uh, I see the first time visitors and it, you know you see them again a couple of weeks later um, and the feedback we get is, is brilliant but um, it's a team effort, um, uh, not just from the SLS but from everyone but um, yeah thank you, thank you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time the head of the Community Foundation, John Stacey. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about the work of the Community Foundation. Hopefully most people in the room already have an awareness of the Community Foundation in that we are the club's official charity. Uh, and our main aims and objectives are to improve the health and well-being of residents within Harrogate and District, to try and foster stronger, safer communities and enrich and enhance the lives of everyone who engages with us on a daily basis. And we do that through um, three of our key programmes, thank you, uh, which are schools, health and wellbeing, and social inclusion. Uh, and this year, so 23-24, our Premier League Primary Stars programme, which is funded through the Premier League Charitable Fund, we've engaged with 13 partner schools, um, and that's more than just football. We use football as the vehicle and Harrogate Town as, the, um, as the, ba the brand and the badge to try and engage those who may not necessarily engage with education. Um, so we use that to um, try and enhance English interventions. So uh, our Reading Stars programme utilises football books and the love that young children have for their famous football players to help them with their English and their literacy by using those books as the tool. Uh, we also have walk to school days, we have special guest player visits, uh, which just add that little bit of, of magic and, um, and sparkle to those events where the children can engage with their favourite players that they see on a match day. Our health and wellbeing programmes, so from um, weight loss and weight management programmes to programmes that help prioritise the mental wellbeing um, of men in our area, we're engaging with just under 100 participants per week um, and some of the, the feedback that we've had from our participants within our mental wellbeing programmes are that the engagement that they have with our staff are significantly life-changing for them. Um, one of our, our flagship programmes that just started this year, Pitch Positive, um, we're getting <laughs> groups of men together and they're, they're able to feel comfortable in an environment to talk about the challenges that they face um, and how they can overcome them with like-minded others, which I think is, is an absolutely fantastic place to be, um, specifically given that football can be a really tough and challenging environment to be in. Um, to be able to, to share those experiences with other people um, is it, just such a fantastic programme. I know we've got people in the room that have um, been part of that programme and their, their stories and their feedback um, is something that we really want to bring to life over the, the next 12 months. So we'll be hopefully um, utilising the Matchday programme and other outlets to get some more case studies of those people um, out into the general public to really provide the, and show the impact that our programmes can have. Our social inclusion programmes, um, these are from Police and Crime Commissioner funded sessions for young people where we're trying to provide diversionary activities from those who may be going down the wrong path using football again as the tool and the, the hook that gets them there to then provide them with some education um, that might be around drugs and alcohol, it might be around um, crime or, or other things that might be just slightly veering off onto a different way. We're using football and Harrogate Town as that hook um, to help them steer them back onto the right path. Um, we also deliver uh, feast funded activities. Um, this is one that, that we're really proud to um, to be able to deliver to the, the Harrogate District. So this year across um, summer, Christmas and Easter, 
we've worked with 901, which is very specific, 901 young people to provide them with healthy activity um, and lunches for those who are eligible for free school meals. For people who are from low social economical backgrounds who may not be able to provide their children um, with meals during the school holidays. And for parents who potentially couldn't go to work without accessing that free service. So we really are trying to enrich and enhance the lives of those people that are engaging with us. Um, we've also recently started our girls' Wildcats programs through the EFL in a targeted manner. So um, putting the sessions into the hearts of the communities where maybe young people wouldn't be able to get to, to Rossett to play at the PDC or they couldn't afford that. We're taking our, our girls' Wildcat sessions uh, into the areas that really need the help and support to attend football um, and we're trying to give them the best possible experience of that, that football environment. We've also got two brand new um, sessions which started this year um, of Premier League Fans Fund, again funded by the Premier League Charitable Fund. Um, two programmes that we think are really important, so engaging with uh, young people in secondary schools, trying to um, help identify the issues that they're facing, um, and again using football as the hook and Harrogate Town as the brand that engages those young people working through the issues um, that are affecting them and trying to help them come up with solutions to, to cope with that. Uh, and the next one, which is, I had a little bit of a slower start, but the, the Young Fans Voice Group will hopefully have its first meeting of interested people uh, in the May half term. Um, we identified, along with, with Hamilton, um, that 12 to 17 year olds are probably the hardest to engage on a match day. Um, a little bit of a missed demographic sometimes, you know, the, the characters that we have around the ground are fantastic, but um, if you're 12, 13, it's maybe not cool enough to go and give, um, give Spider-Man a high five anymore. Um, and, but we can't engage them in, in the bar, we don't really want them to be gambling yet. So what do they do on a match day? Um, and we've created this opportunity for young people to have a voice, to find out um, how we can engage them, how we can, can keep them as fans, but make sure again that they're on the right lines, they're not causing any trouble at, at the games. Um, and we really want them to be a big part of the, the future of the Community Foundation. Um, so they're the, they're the key things that we've been working on in the last sort of 12 months um, and a focus for, for the future of the Community Foundation as well. And now, just before we talk into uh, our pie and peas, right after Simon Weaver. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for attending this evening, and um, it's been great to hear about all the really important people around me um, at this club that really makes you tick uh, during the week. Obviously, we're just at, at, at weekends, and when we play on, on nine games on Tuesdays, um, but it's um, it's been it's been a good season, you know. We're we're pretty satisfied the way we've performed overall. There's been bumps on the road, but we started back in pre-season at, at St Andrews uh, when we went up uh, a long coach journey up uh, up into Scotland and on a training camp for a few days. And uh, Ben Rome has been a, a massive addition uh, as fitness coach at this football club, and he uh, liaised uh, with Rachel and Emily. Um, in the medical staff in the off season of how to put together the program and then dovetail it and the football side and uh, but the main crux of it in Scotland was was about hard work and the lads were up every morning seven o'clock in the gym uh, either a spinning session or power uh, gym session uh, just to make sure that we um, we're prepared properly because it's a it's a physical old league you know and with the with cup games and league games you you're playing in excess of 50 games in the season and uh, players are now covering we, we measure we take all kind of measurements um, but uh, not least the the mileage that players go through you know we've got players like George Thompson regularly 11 12k a, a game and um, the the accelerations decelerations but it was all about making sure that the off the off season program was undertaken by the players in a dedicated way to prepare themselves for the onslaught of pre-season um, which was the same start to have been in in, uh, in Scotland, and there was early morning sessions, followed by breakfast, followed by another session, followed by lunch, followed by another session, followed by tea, and then the fall into bed. Um, absolutely cream cracker, but um, it prepared as well. And the uh, the pre-season fixtures were, were, were decent for us. We, um, we enjoyed the game at, at South Shields, which we thought that we're, uh, we're looking we're looking decent now. We're looking sharp, and the squad's looking. Um, 
stronger, uh, in my view, than, than last season. You know, a fair bit stronger. And so we're all excited about the, the first game of the season at Doncaster, um, which, which went really well for us. Um, in, in preparation until about 48 hours before kickoff, um, where we uh, that was the start of losing one of our players, and um, but it's okay because we had Jack Muldoon, you know, and <laughs> and he played and, and scored and we won the game and it sets us off on the right footing and and the the changing room really rallied and and um, despite the next few games not quite going our way, we played first green, second game, uh, lost here. We had two disappointing away games, Accrington and, and Tranmere, particularly Accrington where I thought, well, we deserve a bit of stick from the terraces here. You know, give us what you, give us what you can if you like, you know, uh, because we weren't up, up to scratch. Um, but we never, I never felt that we'd be in a position where we'd struggle this year. I felt that the lads came back determined um, and it was a cohesive unit, really coachable, likeable lads, uh, determined to do well for the club. Um, we do have to bring lads in on loan, but, but the, there wasn't a real necessity in the summer. Um, and whether it was that sense of belonging that we got in the club, in, in the club, in, in the changing rooms, um, that really sparked something up, and I just felt that we could power through disappointments. We were better equipped to do that. Um, and there's only probably been in a couple of two or three occasions in this season where I've been disappointed. You know, where you think, ah, no, we're better than that, and. Um, Sometimes not just being better than that in terms of performance level, it's, it's the, uh, the honesty factor and I think we've got a great honest group and there's probably been only a couple of times where I thought we've, we've come short in terms of the running, the running and the recovery runs and the snarling and doing what we have to do to find a way to win at Harrogate Town. Uh, but other than that, uh, when I'm saying a couple of times over uh, 40 plus games, I think um, I, I can safely say I'm a, I'm a proud manager of this football club. And, uh, and where it's heading, and where where we've been, and where we are now, we're in a decent spot. Um, I probably didn't expect to be still in with an outside shout of the playoffs at, at this point, um, but I can still hang on to that hope until it's uh, well until we know the outcome. But um, it's been very exciting. Um, the run we had, where we uh, accumulated 20 points uh, from 10 games, um, the run from to the January February run where we turned into the new year and we thought the wind's behind us uh, medically we're in good nick um, yeah the f physically lads are looking great we're, we're able to play different uh, systems uh, particularly found one system where for 10 games we're, we, we found that Actually, the league is struggling to deal with us here. We're, we're playing our way through the thirds. We're splitting at the back. Um, we're outnumbering people in the middle section of the pitch and finding a way through the pitch um, in an attractive style, which is wonderful. Um, and then we played Mansfield, um, <laughs> and, that, and that was that was a tricky old night. Um, and fair play to them for going up, and, and, and the other automatically uh, promoted teams they were they were a cut above. Um, and actually, the very nature of that defeat um, was hard to take on the night. You know, we're not used to we weren't used to losing. Um, I actually had a haircut on the Sunday a few day, a couple of days before that, and someone next to me in the barber said. You're a good town, aren't you? This is, you're one of the badgers on this, this on Twitter on X. Um, you, Man City, Liverpool, you're one of the top teams in England, aren't you? That's undefeated. I said, well, we're not quite that level, um, <laughs> but we're really proud as punch. And anyway, I saw him a few days later. He said, did you lose that too? And I went, yes, yes, we did. So it, it came to an end. But sometimes the it's a big, bigger test of character when you do lose and have a bloody nose. And um, it certainly was for me waking up the next day and I thought, oh, that, that really, that, that hurt. That hurt really deep. Um, but it hurt more seeing the faces of honest lads that felt that, that horrible taste of, of being walloped, you know, and, and having a reality check. Um, and all the things that could go wrong went wrong in one night. And it was a, a stark reminder to us all that don't get ahead of yourselves. Um, as a team that found us, found us out when we're not quite fully on it, um, and we go again. 
and it's, it's as simple as that. You know, we, we we put it behind us. It was it was harder still that it was Valentine's Day that day, and so I probably wasn't you know really excited about that. Um, but but there's always the next game, and that we, we you hear everyone moan about so many games. You know, the top league playing Champions League and all these games, but. The, the good thing about it from my position is there's the next game either to prove people wrong or, or to, to get back on the horse and, and we did and we went to crew and I'm so proud of the players because they they got a clean sheet after conceding nine and we just said get to quarter past three get to quarter past three and fight and snarl do what we have to do we, we prepare the team, the, the team uh, we, we do analysis we do everything in our powers and within our resources to make sure that we're quite succinct with the message and uh, the style and how we how we want to accumulate the points. Um, but that day was pretty much uh, old school. They shall not pass, and uh, uh, and we come away from crew, you know, with a point, and it's a clean sheet at the very least. And and we did that, and I, and I thought we showed our metal. I thought we showed we've got personality, everybody who got on the coach, and I include the supporters coach as well, who got right behind us and it's very much appreciated. And from there, um, the next test was actually a Newport game, the next, very next game at home, and that was one of the disappointments, because, but I knew in the back of my mind that despite having a fantastic response uh, and uh, a real performance that epitomises this club of fight, um, the level demands technical ability and the very next game was a I knew in my heart of hearts a real test of, of our nerve on the ball uh, because I, I knew the confidence had been undermined the week before which is understandable I think everyone in this room would understand that you, you, your performance um, dictates your confidence levels and, and um, when you get a kick in in life you're not going to be full of yourself and we tried to refresh the team a little bit. It backfired, and we weren't very good at building um, and having as much bravery on the ball. And, and we get, got caught and caught and caught, and then re the recovery runs were poor. And that's when, that's when I hit them hard for the first time in quite a while with the video evidence of that, because we needed to re-energize it, and we needed to face our demons and, and ensure that we don't go back for quite a few months uh, you know, we keep plowing on. And to be honest, we, we, we have, you know, the, the blip was over. Um, it was a good game, the Bradford game, to really trigger a, a home win, a home response from the fans, and, um, and to make sure that we ran over a team. And we did it, and uh, scoring three goals and a horrifically another windy day. Um, but to score three home goals, record home attendance, I thought, we're back. We're back, the lads are back, the lads are buzzing and uh, we're going to win a few more games here. Um, and then the Gillingham game, second half, I can promise you it, that was nothing to do with me. It was, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it was good. Um, and we, we loved it. And it just shows you the confidence levels of where you can be in football, how it can suddenly switch around for the, for the worse at times. But if everyone sticks together, and it's not a massive blame game, and people aren't feeling bad about feeling bad about their own performance and guilty it, um, eventually baby steps towards recovery can happen and then it feels rewarding because you see the likes of if you come back onto the pitch and go yeah I'm roaring again George Thompson, Jack Muldeal um, throughout the team to be honest I shouldn't mention individuals um, Anthony O'Connor just you know, picking it up like his Beckenbauer at the back, at the back four, you know, and, and just going, hang, hang on a minute, you know, these guys are playing for Harrogate Town. Uh, you know, the, the, these are making us feel proud because they're not just finding an ugly way to win, they're winning in a blaze of gl glory against a big outfit. And so, it gives me confidence moving forwards. The away, the away form has been awesome this season, and it, and it takes a lot to win at this level away from home. We've kept it tighter, there's been uh, more defensive stability, and we've played some good stuff. We've played some really attractive football, so we're pleased with that, and we're pleased with the last few home games, because uh, at last it feels like we turn the corner at home, and, and it brings that sense of belief, and, and that, that real sense of satisfaction driving home, that knowing that everything, 
everybody else has done at the club, setting up the family excellence award, you know, and the, the family stands, the building the stands, the financial outlay, um, the hard graph commercially, and the, the absolute focus and direction from our chief executive. You go, ah, oh, some paid that for them at last. Um, and then we're heading to uh, the last two games, knowing that we're, we're all in it together. And um, it, it makes all the hard work really feel worthwhile. We aim to win in the next two games, see where, see where we're heading, and, um, and then we'll meet it face on straight after the season in terms of contractual uh, negotiations. My aim is to be steady away with it because you can't say in one breath you, you're happy with the bunch and proud of their, all their amazing efforts, and then in the next breath say, yeah, cheers, see you, see you later. You know, um, you, your contract's expired. You, and I, I appreciate there's always a little bit of a turnover, but there won't be massive changes from my, my position. And um, some people in football always like change, uh, but I believe in having faith in people and uh, in the people that I know I can trust. I know I can. I know that they can take us there. They've had a sense of it, and they've had a feel of it. And um, we've got some good, consistent players in there, and some real stardust as well in there as well. So hopefully we can build on that and come back even better next season. And um, I can't say much about the new kids, but they're really good. <laughs> I actually wanted one for my holiday, but I, uh, I might be the geek football manager walking around in one, but uh, yeah, out of place. But um, so thank you ever so much uh, for listening. In. Hopefully you enjoyed the tour and you took it into the pain days. So um, we can crack on with our, our Q and A session. And thank you very much for all the questions. So uh, quick fire questions. We do it when uh, you find them and take your time. Yeah, you, you took into your pint, but you have your questions up until at least 10 down the list. So you, you know, you've got to. You've got to. Uh, first of all, I've been handed a note. This is very important. I think this is um, it's worthy of a round of applause. Uh, because I've got a note that says, can we give the grand stuff a mention? Because the playing surface, and I thought this when I went into that, it looks absolutely superb. They're an integral part of the team. So round of applause for the grand team. And for the, for the catering stuff as well. So that is the one, please. And for the staff, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, Hannah, first question for you. Grab yourself a microphone, sir, because uh, this question goes like so. What are the club doing? So you mentioned the signage before about getting people to the ground, and uh, rightly so, you go to these other football clubs and you signs up the last mile. So how far on with that are you, and are there any other plans to introduce other things to in encourage people to the ground and show them the way to the environment? Hello. Uh, right, so there's a lot of things in place. It's uh, coming towards the top of it, our agenda. Uh, there's a lot of things, obviously, our, our, out of our control, so it's just a, a waiting game. But we are looking at that, and hopefully, um, you know, soon it'll, uh, we'll have some answers. All right, fantastic stuff. Uh, Sarah, over to you, the next. Uh, a lot of questions I have off you. So, how can we further develop catering facilities to reduce queues and speed up the service, especially as crowds hopefully grow? That's a good question. We've, we've just opened the new kiosk, so it's still not being used fully yet. So we've just um, got that. We need more signage and more awareness of the fact that it's there. So I think we've got to work on that. But we've also implemented a new uh, queuing and booking system for when you're in, in the queue, you can uh, order your food. It seems to be working a lot better. So we'll have to just monitor it and see how the new kiosk goes. We're also putting, we've put food in the marquee. Uh, we're probably gonna put food in the environment bar as well, pies mainly, um, and snacks in the, uh, we've got like a food, uh, a drinks kiosk right at the front next to the shop. Um, and other than that, I don't know yet. Give me time and I'll work it out. <laughs> Keep a check on Facebook, the website. Build up. The usual. <laughs> or down. Into um, the now, any update on the academy? Any players coming through? Um, is it financially viable? Ooh, it's a two-part question, that. Yeah. The, the first part's probably for Simon. 
any academy players coming through? Do you want to answer that one? Well, uh, James Morby is the uh, the player, the one player that's been offered a professional contract for next season. Um, he's uh, he's yeah, done his scholarship, just completed that. Uh, done well um, off the pitch as well as on. You know, his score works, so it set him up. And um, he trained with the first team today, did really well. So, yeah, he's the, he's the next one to be given a pro deal. And, and how good is the academy set up? How impressed are you with it um, in comparison to where it was? say two, three years ago? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a good question, this one, isn't it? Because it, there's been a, a change of tack, really, you know, for, for our academy. Um, we went full time with it. Um, it's a hugely expensive exercise, is joining the CAP4, which is the late development model under 18s, um, because you've got uh, to look after them in terms of residential, uh, staying, staying in a school uh, boarding facilities um, and everything that comes with joining the EPPP um, which is, yeah, you get funding for but, but the, the costs are, are quite incredible so we are, we are changing the look of it after next season um, which some people may think is a backward step but actually it, it's all part of what what we mentioned earlier about being successful but sustainable club. Um, we feel that we've, it's a difficult, a very difficult objective trying to get players through in our current model um, because we, we need to bridge the gap and, and, and perhaps build in a central league team, a you know, reserve team, um, perhaps the year after next, um, and, and, but return the under 18s to what it was prior to this cap four model. Um, because the risk reward is, is, is very, it's very difficult in the format. Uh, we're surrounded by Cap One academies that pump in over a million pounds a year um, into developing kids from five, um, and that's just not feasible for us to, to pick up these Cap Cap One lads. And so we get we do get some useful lads in, but it's, it's looking at the whole thing and thinking, well, actually. Are we that much better doing it this way, or, or the under 18s that we did have that was feeding an, into an under a successful under 21s team where they were playing local? They ended up playing for quite a few for Railway, Tadcaster, Nairsborough. Um, but we need lads that are ready for football league, you know. And it's yeah, so it, it's difficult, but we took the difficult step and we, and we faced up to the parents um, for, from the under 16s this year, which was was not easy because obviously they, they want their lads on a scholarship. Um, but it's not also easy telling eight lads this year that they're getting released and we're just one signing. Uh, so for all that expense, you know, we've got one lad in a one year pro, pro deal. Um, that's not to say that we don't want to create a pathway still because we will. And the cream rises to the top eventually if, if it's dedicated enough and aligned with quality on the football pitch then there is an opportunity to do so We're still here um, but it's, there's more opportunities for more local lads uh, with the model that we will be taking up which will be um, a part-time training two three times a week under 18 model um, and then a central eating and sarah anything to add to that with regards to whether it's financially viable yeah, I think, I think Simon's probably answered the question on that. Um, in our world, no, it's not. Um, and that's the blunt answer. I mean, we're, we're investing over £300,000 a year at the moment in our uh, academy on top of the grant funding that we get. So it's a lottery, really. It's, it's that risk versus, you know, that, that investment. Are you going to find the next big thing and, and how quick, how long is that going to take? Um, and I think we except now a few years on and having the experience that we've dipped the toe in the water with a cap four i think my, my kind of ethos really is go big or go home with it you either go go in properly and do it you know get them in from really young bring them all the way through um or not at all and and we talked to loads of other clubs before making this decision we didn't just go gung-ho oh, this sounds like a better idea we, we've gone and talked to different clubs uh, across the leagues and um, and looked at different models, what's working for other clubs like us, and we're quite unique in the geography. Um, you know, with that within the catchment area, an hour and a half to two hours, we are surrounded, aren't we, by talent? 
Premiership clubs, Championship clubs, League One, as well as League Two, and the amount of clubs, I think you told me it was something like 97% are released from academy, uh, you know, Cat, Cat One academies within our catchment area. So for us to get them in at sort of, you know, 90, age 19, 20, um, where Simon then can develop, and you've seen that with the likes of Kane Ramsey's an excellent uh, example of that. They come in um, inexperienced, not disciplined. Uh, they're still kids, they're growing up, and then give them a year or two with, with your squad and with Simon, under, you know, under Simon's wing, and they're growing up and becoming fantastic footballers and look where they can end up. So I think there's a different pathway for us. And what it has done, as Simon said, is our under 16s now, we would have probably been having two conversations with them with regard to an academy position. And we've got 20 odd uh, under 16s in our advanced PDC, um, all of whom have got potential now to stay with Harrogate Town. Vast majority of them would have had to leave the club and go elsewhere, and they don't have to do that now. So it's a win-win. You mentioned the reduction there, which leads nicely onto this, because this question says, how will we achieve a 7% cost reduction, which you mentioned in your presentation? Will there be an impact on the first team investment? Um, in terms of player budget, um, some of the obvious thing, without going into actual numbers, but we had, you might have heard about a situation we had at the start of the season with a certain player <laughs> that we had a deal fall through um, with, with Wrexham there. You go, that's twice in one night, I can't believe that. Um, and that happened and that was really, really unfortunate for us and it cost us, it cost us dearly. So let's just hope and pray that didn't happen. It can't happen twice, it's like lightning striking twice. That was really unfortunate, but that did cost us a lot of money that we wouldn't have to have, uh, have spent because we thought the deal was done and it wasn't, and therefore we had to invest in more uh, talent to strengthen the squad. So that, that was, I think we were about day one of the new year and <laughs> that happened. So, you know, it's bad luck as well. Um, so that's an obvious one. Um, what we've just talked about, which is uh, reshaping the youth development system and pathway, um, there's massive cost reductions in that. Um, however, we're not doing that as an exercise to cost save. I mean, there is that that's a consequence of doing it, obviously. And we need to be, um, we need to look at that. But some of that investment will go towards um, Simon's, uh, you know, first team squad. Not not next season, probably the season after, in terms of reinvesting in more of a for a B B side or reserve side, as we call it. Um, and again, you're better placed to say this than me, but it will help the fringe players as well. It's not just about the physical well-being, it's the mental well-being as well and getting everybody the game time that they, they really want, because that's always hard to, to manage. So there are massive cost savings there as well. But as I said in the very, very outset, we're not about squeezing the, the club so tight that we can't grow. I don't believe that's the way to run a business. The vast majority um, of, of what we're going to be doing in terms of you know getting better shape financially is, is about turnover and growing. And the next one, could you please elaborate on what you meant by learning to be a bigger club? What do other similar clubs do that we admire? Yeah, it's a good, a good question that one. Um, loads of different <coughs> things. I think internally first off, um, for some of the team, unlike me, that's coming from the outside and never worked in the industry, um, going from being in the lower leagues, National League, into becoming an EFL professional football club is a massive step. And um, there's so many more rules and regulations, I've, I've said it before, for us to learn. And then we have to educate our uh, all our stakeholders and what that looks like. Um, the compliance and the safety side is a learning exercise, you know, I said earlier, we're the only club, uh, league club in North Yorkshire under our um, safety advisory group, so that's everyone from the police, the fire to North Yorkshire Council, to highways, ambulance service, you name it. 
um, and they're more cautious than your average safety advisory group because we're the, we're the first club under them. Uh, we're the only club, so we have 100% of the attention. Um, you go to West Yorkshire and other places, you know, they've got hundreds of sports grounds and clubs to look after. Um, whereas with us, everything's the first, everything. You know, we're going, right, okay, can we have a pre-season friendly with X club up the road? And we're having to go, oh, what are their fans like? What are the behaviour like? We're on Weatherby Road. It's the busiest road in and out of Harrogate, as we know, one of them. That's the challenge for us. So it's it's a loads of different things, is that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're getting there now. And, and learning from other clubs, I, learn, I go to all the away games pretty much. Um, I don't think there's a ground now I haven't been to. Apart from Forest Green, I never got to that. And I might do if we get a draw, you never know. Can't, that one I just haven't got to, but I go to every away game and learn something every single time. Um, and I think that's the, the secret for us because we're a young club in the league terms at least. We don't know it all and we don't profess to and the best work for me is like, you know, you're not going to reinvent the wheel. Go and look and talk and build a network with all the other clubs and they are really helpful. I mean, it's really competitive for you on the pitch. Off the pitch, they're really nice. <laughs> So it is good though, no, seriously, you know what I mean? You, you can literally pick up the phone to anyone and say, have you tried this before? Everybody's sticking together. Yeah. Um, now, quite a few of you flagged match day experience, so thank you for that. The music was uh, was one issue. Turn it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right there with this PA, I'll be honest. Right, so we've had the meeting this morning. Um, we've had Tom in, who looks after our PA, and we've reset the... Uh, um, what do you call them? The lash... No, this has been in radio for years. Levels. That's the word. <laughs> So we never allowed you near well, the studio to be fair. No, so. you didn't. That, there's a reason for that. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to say any more on that. We think we've reset it to what it should be. Can you tell me how it goes after Saturday? Oh, sorry, it's last game. No, you can't. Feed it back, feed it back. We hope, we hope we've got it to where it should be. And just apologies, apologies for that. Another thing with regards to the match day experience, um, somebody suggested, which I personally think is a good idea actually, um, a competition of some sort at half time, like a crossbar challenge, something like that. Yeah, I love that. We'll do it. We'll there we go, that was an easy one, wasn't it? Not Jump the run, crossbar not challenge. Saturday, we'll sort it Saturday. Uh, right, another one for you, Sarah. Do the women's team get funded? If so, how much compared to the men? Um, funded, they get support from the club, but they don't get fully funded, no. Um, but that is something we'll be looking at. Um, we do look to get sponsorship. We're, we're part funding a trip away. They're going on a pre-season or end-of-season tour uh, to Spain. Um, so we are looking to do more. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> you, really, you really won't up. Don't want to. Um, yeah, it's, we'd like to do more of that. That is... I think I mentioned earlier part of the uh, the plans going forward and how we expand on that. Uh, also, how much will corporate cost next season? <laughs> uh, you need to speak to Joanne about that. Joanne, Joanne is the son of Joe. Um, we haven't actually had that discussion in final terms yet. Um, about the same, I would have thought. Yeah, well, she's nodding. She's probably going to kill me for saying that. Depends who's asking. Mm. Yeah. No, no. No, no. All anonymous, Joe. Uh, right, why don't the club give out the number of away supporters when the attendance is announced on match days? Yeah, we stopped doing that age about two seasons ago, I think. We just give out the, the overall attendance. And it was right in the early days when our crowds were, probably two years ago, weren't as good as, um, as they are now. Uh, and we made that decision on that basis, really, because we didn't want it to look like the away fans were, were bigger than ours, and, you know, that's the honest answer. Um, and, yeah, that's it. There's no other reason now. Maybe we, we'll start doing that. Um, it's been mentioned that a lot of good things are being publicised through the Matchday programme, but 
Uh, can you clarify the rumour, the whispers that are flying around that the match day programme is is no more? I don't know where that's come from, honestly. We, we, we're not... I saw, well, I saw it on Facebook. I know, I know it's there because someone told me about it. Um, no, it not must, true. Must be true. We, we don't... It's not a money-making exercise. We don't make any money with the programme. We break even with it, but people want the programme. As long as you want the programme, you can have it. As long as we're not losing loads and loads of money, we're not, so... Uh, now, another mention for Wrexham tonight. Did we get any compensation from Wrexham when they failed to complete the transfer of Luke Armstrong? No. Okay. That was almost like a pantomime business, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, where, are, um, where are we saving on costs, says this question. Where is the club left if, in any circumstances, uh, funding is no longer available? Yeah, well, I think I might have answered the first bit already. Um, the funding, you've, you've, you've heard from Irving about the, uh, the situation that we're in. So I guess what we've got to do at some point, depending on what happens with this, um, you know, redistribution of the rent, if that comes in, then we can see, you know, happy days. If that doesn't come in, we've got to look at unconventional ways of bringing more money into the club um, and further down the line that would be a conversation um, that you know we have to have other clubs if you look at the Wimbledon model for example and how they operate they can do it you can do it in different ways of funding the club so that at the moment I think that if I was sat in the supporters shoes it's more about reassurance with investment now and um, when we get asked that all the time so, you know, we're, we're planning forwards. Um, it, it's really up to us to find to, a way of squeezing the losses down to a sustainable amount. That can't happen overnight. You've seen, you've seen the, the graphs. It might take us two to three years before we get to a, you know, a more manageable figure and a more manageable sum. Is that right? Is it fair? It, it's, a re it's reality. It's where we're at. Um, and I was just saying to somebody in the break, you know, out of the um, the time that we've had in the football league without the pandemic affecting us, we've spent three, you know, a, a year and a half of that building the stadium. So the year that we're about to go into, the new financial year, is the first year that we are planning uh, the budget knowing what we've got. <laughs> It, it, honestly, that is that's where we're at, and um, I can't tell you the difference it's making. Uh, final question for you this evening, Sarah. Could the club use the church car park on match days over the road because there's about 50 car parking spaces there? Um, I don't think we use that one, do we? I'm, I'm looking. Them. Yeah, we have asked, and they have um, declined. Okay. We, numerous times, I'm told, we've asked. But we do, we're getting there with that. We're getting more parking uh, partners. That's the right phrase, but yeah. <laughs> uh, right, thank you very much. Sarah Irving, I've got a question for you, good self. If you can step forward. The one and only question for you, Irving, tonight. Uh, and it goes like so. How are the plans for the new training facility? This was asked quite a bit, actually. Uh, so the new training facility, where are you at with, with the plans going forward? Yeah, this has been uh, a journey, a six-year journey. Um, several sites, or multiple sites, and planning and all the rest of it. Yeah, and we've got... We're more confident of uh, securing a site that could lead to giving us uh, a reasonably modest but two-pitch um, training ground. Uh, again, we've got to time the finances, the planning position, the permissions take forever. Um, we, we don't want to set the hairs ready, we want to be modest about it and let's deliver quietly when we've gone through all the pains of, of contract, of location, of planning. Um, it's not easy. And um, as long as we're on the track to get there in the end, I think that's all we can say at this stage. Is, is there any time scale, or do you just don't, you just don't know? 
my, uh, my background is, in, is trying to get planning conditions for housing. Um, the statutory time is 13 weeks. Our average time is 46. <laughs> I think that probably answers it, really. Yeah, quite a while. You've got to wait a bit longer, yet, right, ladies and gents. Thank you. Uh, Simon, over to you. So, with so many requirements driven by league rules in our first four seasons, how are we getting on? Is the list almost complete? Sorry, just turning the microphone on there. Just so, with so many requirements driven by league rules in our first four seasons, yeah. how are we getting on? Is the list almost complete? Well, in, yes. in terms of the uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, the off-field requirements are not really my my bag. Really, you know, this is this is in, in the office and, and making sure that all the criteria for the ground. That's it's not really what I do day to day. But but thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, so much for <laughs> the, the, answer, the quick answer is yeah, we're done now, so we've met all the criteria for the ground. Excellent. Finally. There we go. Now this one is definitely for you. Uh, which positions would you like to strengthen over the summer? Well, um, I'm going to stay loyal to what I said before in terms of the, the, the group have done really well, and, and so it's not, it's not as if... Um, in some cases, you know, the, you know the, the typical clubs at our level that just go right, bang, we're going to do that. It's not straightforward. Um, you've heard everything tonight. And we've, we've got to make sure that we, we run it right and we reward the players that have done well, first and foremost, which adds to the feel good factor and the, the change in believing in, in us as people and, and the club and the, and the fact that they belong and uh, have got better. You know, we've got the likes of George Thompson who've I'd be very surprised if he doesn't win an A Player of the Year trophy. He's got better and better uh, through perseverance, through desire, sheer character. Um, and we've seen the benefits of that. Um, Jack Muldoon's another one at 34. He's just been ripping it up. And, and so before I'd announced that, oh yeah, well, we're going to go and get another right wing, another centre forward, another this and that, I, I've got to respect these lads first and make sure that they're happy. Uh, to remain with us and a few of the outer contract players too. Um, we're always on the, on the lookout. It's not just saying it, but despite what I've said, we're, we're always on the lookout. And I've got Lloyd with me now, <coughs> who's um, been in a couple of times this week, and we're discussing the, you know the budget and, and potential players. And quite often, you know, of course, we'd like another forward in, you know, to uh, of a physical stature that could help us um, replace what we've had previously um, give us another dimension but it has to be the right one you know I'm not just going to jump in and just get someone who's just six foot three and can't run and you know he's got to be the right person as well and come because he wants to come and play for Harrogate Town you know we've lost out in previous years to certain players who, who played for local rivals because because of the training ground situation or because of uh, kudos of uh, playing in front of 19,000 at Bradford or whatever, you know, and you, I'll be going through the same old routine in the off season and it started already, you know, with agents contacting us and, and then further down the line they can go quiet because we, we haven't got this or got that, but, you know, we've, we've built a squad now that we think is very competitive and anything on top of that I have to take seriously, is it going to improve us properly? You know, and is he, is he the right animal? Because I've been there before when you bring someone in or snatch at a sign in and to appease other people, but they've got to appease me first and, and the change room. What about the following on from that? Actually, this one flags the players out on loan and the plan potentially to bring any of them, some of them back. Well, we, we are, we're watching James Daly uh, because obviously. We went for him last summer and he's such a good character, really bonuses the days long, made his debut, league debut for us at, um, at Doncaster and, and, and played a good part in it and obviously he came off the bench against Doncaster, scored an important goal as well. Um, we allowed him out because we thought, you know, he was keen to get games, I was keen for him to really have a run of games and um, he's played some minutes at, at, at Aldershot. 
and then we'll have a chat again. I reckon a couple of weeks ago, and he's on his way to train, and then just see how it was. And he was happy to be playing games, and, uh, and we'll have another discussion and and see if it's the, the right thing for for him as well as us. Next one is: What is your reasoning for not leaving a man up on corners? If a defender gets a good header, the ball comes straight back. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we have done at times, um, but quite often. Quite often, there's a bit of a few gamblers as managers as well uh, in this league that will go well. We'll leave, we'll leave one back and we'll stick another one on on um, on the edge. And it's um, it, it, what I don't like to be is outnumbered in the box, you know. And if someone does, then I drag another one back and we we'll make sure that we secure. And I think the first objective of any defensive situation set piece, including corners, is um, don't concede. You know, and um, that we can break quickly from the edge, and, and we normally have two players on the edge of the box with pace ready to go. Uh, next question reads: Why are we now kicking towards the away end in the second half? Is this purely on the toss of the coin? No, it was a, it was a choice really because we we'd had a bit of a shocking record for some time at home, and then we we thought, well, I've tried a lot of tactics. We could try swapping ends, and. Um, <laughs> And so we did, and, it, and it's, it, it, well, it, yeah, it, it, we won the game against Bradford, so we're a bit superstitious um, as a football lot. And uh, the next game, so should we do it again? And scored five goals in that half, so you know, let's keep doing it. We're undefeated. Does that mean that you won't get your hair cut if you were to play Mansfield again? Given you mentioned superstition, because you you said at the mm. start didn't you you got your hair cut a few days before. Well, I have done, and we got a result last weekend. So <laughs> You're all right. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't mention that. Uh, do you think not pushing and signing a striker in January is, in hindsight, could be a missed opportunity? Oh, I think that's a difficult one. And I think we discussed the the expense of having obviously. We had to. We replaced uh, Luke on the final day of the transfer deadline, uh, the transfer window. Um, but then Luke remained with the club, and so we've lost out. We lost out on that fee, and then put another fee on the on the on the wages, and so that has ramifications for the next window. And it's as simple as that. So I don't think it's in a case of missed opportunity. The opportunity was taken away from us in, in August that may have. We may have been able to deal with January in a different light. Um, now, a few people raised this one actually. Today's announcement about no longer having replays in the FA Cup from round one onwards. Um, how do you think that will impact clubs like Harrogate Town, particularly with regards to, to finances? A lot of people are flagging this. Yeah, I think it's really disappointing news for anyone who belongs in League One and League Two, um, uh, getting on an FA Cup run. It, you know, was we've seen in our past can bring in a lot of revenue, but not just that, just for its community, brings the club into, it raises the profile, and it's that bit of magic. But massively, you know, the the revenue it brings and uh, TV monies um, from earning. A, if we had a big club here and then took them back to their place, we'd be on television, wouldn't we? And uh, we lose out on a lot of money. But I think it. The game is running the top top six, top eight of the Premier League, and have, that's that power base that drives the game in this country. I'm afraid. Pre-season friendlies have been raised on a uh, a couple of sheets. So, any plans yet, or is it is it too soon? And yeah, we we, we, we pencil some in. Um, <laughs> and we've got some good fixtures lined up, and, and hopefully, I don't. Can I announce any? Yeah? Where's Mary? Mary. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> no, you can't. Come on, Mary. <laughs> Please. Not even if we bought you a new shirt. <coughs> no. Somebody said not Darlington. Why? All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um, no, we're looking at. We, 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 but we, I can safely say that we've we've pen, we've penciled in four really good, big, high-profile clubs at home from hopefully July the 19th. Watch this space. Um, now, this one says, um, Josh Falkingham, um, what are Josh's plans? Is there gonna be a testimonial for him? Are we at that stage? 
Well, I'm hoping that we're at that stage for me first. <laughs> <laughs> I might be due too soon. Um, I don't know, we've not really discussed um, any testimonials, to be honest, um, for any players. But, but he's, he's a legend, so, you know, obviously at some point in the future it'd be great to discuss something for folks because, um, yeah, he's, he's contributed so much and lifted trophies for us and driven the lads on. He's an incredible leader, yeah. Uh, now this one is open to anybody who wants it on the panel. Uh, the new television deal with Sky, um, they ask the impact that it has on iFollow, uh, plus what games are you going to be able to show and that the fans can watch? We don't honestly know yet. Um, that's the truth. We don't know how many we will be featured on. It's just. We know there's going to be a lot more uh, League Two fixtures uh, featured than there are currently, but there's not, there's no guarantee. I did ask this question a couple of weeks ago at an EFL meeting as to whether it's going to be fairly or evenly distributed. Um, there, there is no um, clause in the contract to say they can't pick the same team every single time. So we, we just don't know the answer to that one. And just finally, no more questions brought from any of you. Uh, and while we've got everybody in the room as well, is there anything important that you want to say about this coming Saturday? Because it is going to be a big celebration. And thank you to um, the fans. Yeah, um, I, I think we've put it out there already. If you haven't seen it, um, obviously it's a massive game for us, our last home fixture. Um, so this year, we, it's our thank you to supporters day, um, so we've got loads planned, but for straight immediately after the game, um, the players are going to be coming uh, back on for the lap of honour. We're going to be doing the player awards um, straight after that, uh, as well as the independent supporters club player awards as well. Um, and we're also going to be signing uh, autographs for the players and the, uh, and the, the management team as well for a good half an hour after that as well, um, which proves really popular. So obviously we'd love as many of you who come into the game, well one, please come to the game, <laughs> it's the last one, but to um, stay behind and join us because you've been a massive part of, of this year and uh, we can't do it without you. So we'd love you to be there. Well, ladies and gents, thank you so much for coming along tonight. Have we, have we got time, it's a blast day, no or are we out of time? Oh yeah, are we, are we good? We're still open? Yeah. Speak to Hamill, not me. Yeah, yeah. we're good, right, we're still open. One final question, go on, Jack. Um, we're allowed to DJ on a Tuesday evening, but we're not allowed the drum. Is there anything to do with planning, or is that just a rule what the club have, have just got over the years? It's a planning, uh, condition in the planning um, agreement, Jack. So, you know, when we got the um, extension done for in here, and. Whenever we get anything, it could even be the LED scoreboard. It, we just get these conditions that we have to agree to just to get it over the line. And that's one of them, unfortunately. So instead of a drum, we thought we'd just get a DJ instead. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it might change, but it, it's just not, you know, you have to pick your battles sometimes. And that's sort of one of them. Well, ladies and gents, thank you so much for all of the questions. Get yourself another drink and thank you to our panel as well.